Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Fantastic. Um, it's my uh, delight to welcome you all to our in-person 2022 CSIC Distinguished Lecture. I can't tell you how much more fun it is to do this in person <laughs> than online. Um, so it's great to have so many of you who've made it here in spite of everyone's best efforts at disrupting our transport mechanisms. Um, it does help to be in a city where most people travel by bicycle, I think. Um, so not only is this our first um, distinguished lecture in person for three years, but we have the delight of welcoming Rachel Skinner, who um, you're not quite the outgoing president uh, anymore. I think I'm the, now the immediate the, past president. The immediate <laughs> past president of the <laughs> Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, Rachel is an executive director at WSP, where she leads the corporate responsibility and government relations, having previously led the transport business. And as I said last year, she served as the 156th president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And she's a patron of women in transport because she was only the second woman to hold the role of president in the ICE. <laughs> We're hoping that there'll be a third one in a sort of slightly another quicker pace yeah, in, a, in another couple of years. Um, she's also a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. She's a chartered engineer and a chartered transport planner. And importantly, she chairs the carbon stream of the infrastructure client group, which is working with all the big infrastructure clients to try and reduce our carbon emissions, both from construction and operation of infrastructure. Um, in 2016, she was listed as one of the Telegraph's inaugural UK top 50 influential women in engineering, so that's quite the accolade, and was the um, most distinguished winner and best woman civil engineer in Women in Civil Engineering Awards. And in 2019, the Financial Times confirmed her as one of the UK's top 100 women in engineering. I would have said probably top 10, but there we go. Um, <laughs> she's <laughs> authored and scripted many publications and films on topics around shaping zero and net, carbon, net zero carbon for infrastructure. Apologies. Um, and she was awarded the CBE for Services to Infrastructure in the 2022 New Year's Honours List. So today, she's going to be talking to us about sustainable infrastructure for the 2020s and what might good really look like. Rachel, thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Fantastic. I feel like after that introduction, I can sort of sit down and just <laughs> go home. There we go. Um, so a little tiny bit about me, just to kind of add a tiny bit of flavour that becomes relevant a bit later on. Um, I'm not an engineer. Well, I wasn't an engineer to start with. I was a geographer um, who fell into transport and then sort of accidentally became a civil engineer along the way. And clearly, as you've just heard, it hasn't gone so badly, which is, which is kind of OK. But actually, it's really relevant just in even setting off in terms of talking about sustainable infrastructure to understand that tiny bit of my context, because the topic of sustainability is a thing that I remember learning about when I was at university not doing civil engineering. Which is, which is quite interesting, because, of course, at the time, all the people doing engineering courses weren't learning about sustainability. But there we go. Um, so what I want to do today is speak in hopefully fairly plain English and, and set out a very practical view. I'm very conscious I'm definitely not an academic. But as Jennifer said, if we wanted an academic, we wouldn't have invited you. So that's OK. So, so I think we're all clear on that one. Um, what I want to kind of set out in terms of a proposition in terms of you know what really good sustainable infrastructure might actually really look like for this decade and of course beyond I want to kind of just take a bit of a common sense approach a bit of an intuitive approach and, and at times perhaps quite an opinionated approach and I'm sort of hoping to provoke a little bit of a reaction from time to time because if I go too far you can you can sort of tell me that, that that's what I've managed to do but in in provoking that thought again in terms of just my my general style those of you who, who know me my approach is always very much from the glass half full side of the fence. So while it might feel at times we're diving down into some pretty negative stuff, actually it's from the point of view that we've really got to just get to grips with it and sort it out. It's not because we're going to sit here and throw up our hands and, and give up and go home. So a lot of what I'm about to say is very much informed by my year as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers throughout last year, essentially, which, of course, was pretty much all online. I did get three events in person right at the end, but everything else was pretty much sitting in front of various camera screens and, and, and you know, laptop screens and all the rest of it. Um, but it's very much picking up the threads of that story. So I talked all of last year about the climate crisis, and I was the first one of the ICE presidents to pick that as my theme. Um, and I would like to think it went quite well in terms of just bringing a really big topic and just setting it out in a way that just say, look, this is what we've got to think about if we're going to make sure that what we actually deliver, i.e. the infrastructure across all of our different sectors, whether we're talking about transport or water or energy or waste or digital or buildings or whatever else it might be, if we're going to be able to stand up and say that it's good, we've clearly got to tune into some of these really big topics of the day. We can't just carry on in this vacuum where we ignore the fact that we're having these wider impacts on the world. 
And as the year went on, it became, it continued to be around in particular the net zero carbon side of things. But increasingly, it also became about the resilience side of the equation because it became obvious that actually in order to talk about attacking the climate crisis and attacking some of the issues to do with sustainability, which of course are even bigger than the climate crisis, um, we also need to think about the defensive strategy as well because that is the only way we're going to buy ourselves time. So, oh, this is going to work, let's see. What am I pointing at? There we go. Um, so what I want to talk through um, in terms of an overall structure, I suppose, is to start off in terms of some thoughts around what this really good phrase might mean, I've used it quite intentionally. I've put it in quotes. It, it's, it's quite a conscious use of those, those two words together. I want to talk a little bit about where I think we are now in terms of 2022 and some context and so on. And then I want to come on to three big challenges. And none of them are technical. And none of them require 17 decimal places. And all of them just require some common sense and some intuition, as I say, and some thought in terms of how do we go about this. So I think we have a really, really big challenge to crack around language i.e. speaking the same language. I think we have a huge challenge around confidence and ownership and things to do with that, taking accountability. And I think we have a huge challenge to do with pace and the, and the speed of change and the acceleration of the change that we need to see if we're really going to get to where we actually need to be. And hopefully that will bring us out the other side in plenty of time for some questions. Um, so the, the kind of the proposition, I guess, that, that I wanted to set out hopefully fairly clearly to all of you, is that I think we are sitting on top of genuinely the biggest and most exciting opportunity for infrastructure, for civil engineering, however you want to define it in that sort of big sense. The, the biggest opportunity, essentially of, of all time, going right the way back to the Industrial Revolution when we sort of first lit the sparks and several hundred years ago in terms of the, you know, the way that that then became the way in which we enabled all of the built environment to come about in, it, in its sort of modern sense as we all know it today. But if we're going to seize this really exciting sort of moment in time, this opportunity, we've actually got to do some really urgent and really important work right now to make sure that we're totally clear about what it is we're trying to achieve when it comes to sustainable infrastructure and that we really understand what this phrase good actually really looks like in the context of where we are right now in the 2020s. Because I think that the definition of really good, and again, I keep on wanting to do this all the time, that the definition of really good when it comes to infrastructure systems, when it comes to specific infrastructure assets of any type across any of our different sectors, I think they, they should, they, they must, they ought to, to, to look like and to work in a way that is very, very different to the way that they actually do work right now. I think that definition of what really good must, should, ought to look like has actually already changed. And I think it's us that need to make the running in terms of changing what our kind of mindset, I suppose, and how we think about that. Because I think that literally everywhere we look, that changing definition around what good now really means, it's actually been shifting for about 70 years. And we've been somewhat blind to it, if I'm perfectly honest. And I think now, if we don't hurry up and sort of catch up to it and take that ownership of it, we are going to find ourselves in a place where actually our our relevance in the world, our visibility in the world, which is stuff that we often find as a struggle in any case, might well go backwards instead of, instead of forwards. So if the definition of really good has already shifted and has been shifting for decades, then logic kind of suggests that the definition of really not good, or not good enough, has also shifted. And I would say that there's absolutely definitely a need for this clarity and for this definition right now in terms of where we all sit. And so the, the, the reason, I suppose, for really thinking about it in, overall, in an overall sense right now is because of the context of where we find ourselves right now. And it would be no surprise to see some of the images appearing on the side here and, and indeed on another side in just a minute as well in terms of the context of where we actually are right now and why right now there is so much change going on, why this definition of really good in terms of infrastructure really does matter. So we've become really used to talking about the fact that we live in a really uncertain world. We've, we, we quite like talking about this, how complicated everything is, and this state of flux and the fact there's all this stuff that we don't really understand coming. And, 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 that, and that in itself is... It's good. I mean, it's just, it's, it is just the way of life right now in terms of these complex systems and, and the complex built environment that we live within and, of course, also the changes that we're kicking off all around us in terms of our climate systems and so on. So we know we live in, in a world of flux. We know we live in a world with COVID now. We know we live in a world with new conflict. And around here, speaking locally, of course, we're living in a world with Brexit. And, and we're living in a world now where not just us, but beyond us as well, we're learning to live again with inflation and all sorts of other big themes and topics, which are things that aren't 
not very familiar to us, but absolutely this state of uncertainty is all the way through. We're, we're living in an increasingly digital world where, where the physical assets that we're used to getting out there in the world are becoming increasingly smart and are increasingly digital, and that blurring of the lines between the two is absolutely carrying on as we go. But I think most importantly, from my point of view, and this is no real surprise in terms of where I'm likely to be going with this, most importantly, in terms of where we are today, we live in a world where this climate crisis is suddenly, at last, finally, becoming a real thing that we recognise we actually have to deal with. I'm sure you all recognise these climate stripes, I sincerely hope so. Um, so anybody who, who thinks there isn't a climate crisis just needs to sort of cast their eye from left to right and realise that that is, in fact, the, you know, the evidence of the changing temperature at a global level, year by year by year by year by year. Um, up to, broadly speaking, where we are now. So I don't really want to sit here now and rehearse the decades of evidence that have been building around the fact that there is a climate crisis, because there's no need. And I definitely don't want to sit here and debate about, uh, you know, whether or not this change is really happening, whether it's really going to stick, whether it's something that we really need to, to get to grips with, because I think it's fairly obvious that that's not a thing that's really up for debate. I'm also not really going to want to debate, because I spent all last year doing it, whether or not infrastructure and all the things, all these built environment systems that we play a part in are at the root cause, in a majority sense, of some of this climate change and climate crisis, because actually we kind of know they are. When you add it all up, and I know there's loads of different numbers out there, but broadly speaking, if you look at cities, you can see they're responsible for 80%, broadly speaking, of our carbon emissions or carbon and equivalent greenhouse gas emissions as well. If we look at infrastructure, when you put it all in together in terms of the influence, the impact of infrastructure, the emissions that it enables, it's easily 70% of the total emissions that are actually out there. So we don't need to rehearse that. We don't need to run through all the, the sort of cause and effect and that kind of thing. But what I think I really do want to spend time on right now is thinking about how we're behaving as a result of understanding that, because we've suddenly had this moment where we've seen, oh, hang on, there really is actually a problem here, and we're now beginning to understand that from an engineering point of view, from an infrastructure point of view, we have been, in part, quite large part, responsible for, for allowing some of these changes to happen to the built environment. We haven't been out there using all these systems and necessarily causing all of the problem, but we have put the infrastructure in place that has allowed the problem to fester and to exist and to grow and to build and so on. So, so we, I think, do actually have a very clear responsibility in terms of thinking through, okay, so what do we need to do about that? And I think we need to make a really clear judgment call on whether or not we do genuinely believe, as a set of professionals, that there is, in fact, a climate emergency. And then the follow-on question, which is where we start to get into the language point in just a moment, is actually, are we sure that in saying there is a climate crisis, in going around you know, declaring climate emergencies, in, in talking about all these issues to do with climate and so on, are we sure we're all speaking the same language? Because I am pretty sure, actually, that if you were to genuinely look out there and kind of take stock across the world of infrastructure, what you'd actually find is that people are talking about all sorts of different things. And none of them are quite sure if it's sufficient. And none of them quite know really what they're actually talking about. Because, I mean, even when you look at the sort of top level in terms of either global um, you know, UN-type activities or whether you look at the UK-based policy setting, that kind of thing, yes, there is an effort to push things in the right direction. But when you actually get into the corners of our industry and actually see what's really going on, very often the answer is not very much. That's all that different to yesterday because nobody quite knows what they're actually doing and really what good necessarily actually looks like. Yes, there are some standout great points that are coming through and some changes that are happening, but are they enough? Do we all understand each other? Do we know where the good things are hiding? I, I, would, I would suggest not. So I think we really do have to, as I say, ask ourselves very, very clearly, you know, do we genuinely believe that there is a climate emergency. Because if we do believe that, and if we, I'm quite sure if we did a straw poll in the room right now, we'd all agree there was, then actually we might be forgiven for thinking, well, that's okay, then that's great. You know, job done. We've declared an emergency. Right now we can all get on with it and we can sort it out. But I think we have to have a sort of a second thought, and I guess maybe if there's any Pratchett fans out there, you'll, you'll, you'll pick up on that kind of first thought, second thought side of things. I think we have to let these second thoughts kind of sneak in and think, well, actually, are we really behaving as if there's genuinely a climate emergency across infrastructure? Because either we think there is an emergency or we think there isn't. Either we're diver diverting the right amount of resources and time and effort and so on to sorting this out, or we aren't. Because, uh, frankly, if it is genuinely an emergency, we can't stop until it's actually resolved, can we? So, so I suppose then we get a set of questions around, well, did we do everything we could 
yesterday, today, this morning, this afternoon? Did we do everything we could to really act in a way that genuinely embeds that emergency type thinking into, into what we actually have been doing? So is there a way we could have made different decisions that took better account of this? Is there, is there a way we could have encouraged our teams to think more positively about new creative solutions that really might have taken us further forward? Um, are we sure we've got the right climate fact, the right data, the right language at our fingertips to be able to inspire others to think about this more clearly? Are we, could we do more to, to plan or design for you know, lower carbon outcomes, lower climate impacts, that kind of thing? Could we create things differently? Have we actually thought about not building things at all? Now, I'm guessing in a room like this one, actually, we probably have got some people who have been thinking about some of those things, and that's fantastic. But I can tell you with absolute certainty, out there in the wider industry, that is not actually what is going on. We have a lot of people who are literally doing what they did yesterday. And what they did yesterday is what they did the day before, and the day before, and the day before. And, and, and really, yeah, this, is, this is hard, right? It, I'm not sitting here suggesting this is easy to think about. And it, I suppose if it was easy, we'd have done it already, wouldn't we? But we, we know that this whole thorny problem of climate, which is just one piece of a much bigger sustainability picture here, this thorny problem is not going anywhere unless we actually get stuck in and engage and recognise the fact that these, these greenhouse gases, they don't respect boundaries, they're invisible, and, and you know, they are only going to sort themselves out if we actually get to grips with some of the, the core of the problem, and we can't simply rely on others to, to kind of do it for us, I suppose. But I think, as I say, if we actually look out at what's going on out there in the industry, what we'd actually find is that there is some, there is some bright evidence, as I say, there's a growing kind of a nagging doubt that maybe what we're doing isn't quite good enough in the sense of infrastructure overall. And I think we can see that. We can see it, for example, in the planning system. It's quite interesting at the moment to have a look at how people are justifying the case for investment and trying to get you know, basic planning permission to do various different things across the infrastructure space. There is a lot more attention being paid to some of these issues right now, so that's good. But essentially what we've done is we've armed the general public with a very, very lightweight and easy to throw carbon kind of a rock that they can, they can fling at essentially any infrastructure scheme they like because actually we don't know the answers yet. We haven't really thought it through and we haven't really got to grips with actually how do we really answer this question? Have we really thought about the full impact of this? Have we fully mitigated it? Have we done that not just at the stage when we build a thing but all the way through its whole life or not? How, how have we really articulated that and made it very clear? And I think we, we can also see updates to things like standards and, and various, I guess, sort of systems guidance, that kind of thing. We can see some of this change coming through. So there is some positivity out there. But generally speaking, while it feels like we're on a bit of a journey towards better infrastructure for this decade, because we have at least acknowledged the first problem, which is that, yeah, there is a problem out here. Overall, though, the, the, the actual pace of change and the scale of change that's going to be required here is something which I think is still pretty much mind-blowing to the vast majority of people actually out there. And, and this is really not helped at all by the fact that in all of this time that we've started to talk about these issues much more seriously across our different sectors, I still don't know what I'm pointing at, I'll just point vaguely over here, <laughs> uh, we have a real challenge, as I say, of, of language. And I think at the moment, and again, it would be interesting to do a bit of a straw poll, and maybe if there are any questions later on this, I'd be interested to hear whether you agree with me or not. I think that if we are being brutally honest, an awful lot of us are using words in the climate space that we don't necessarily fully understand. We have to recognise the definitions are shifting all the time, which makes it really, really difficult because we're advancing the state of the art and what good looks like and what best practice looks like and so on. And I have a feeling there's a bit of an echo chamber going on where people are repeating what they hear, whether or not they fully understood it, and, and actually, as a result, we're confusing each other. And if we're confusing each other, then we're definitely confusing the people sort of out there beyond our professional spaces because there's absolutely no way that they understand what's, what's really going on. I would put it to you that I think we're not comparing like with like at the moment. We're not comparing apples and apples. I think people are measuring the things that are easy to measure in terms of carbon impacts. They're not necessarily measuring the right things to measure in terms of really, you know, what is the climate effect of what we're talking about here. Um, I think we're very guilty, as I say, of using language quite carelessly at times. And I, it, once you kind of tune into it, you hear it all the time, on, whether it's on the news, whether you read it even in technical professional journals, whether you see it written in professional reports, it's everywhere. And I think we're not calling each other out on it because actually none of us have necessarily got all the language that we actually need to be able to do that with confidence as things stand. So I think, I think I mean, there's a whole swathe of terms. There's a few of them on the, on the side here um, that really we do actually need to get to grips with. And I suppose key amongst those in terms of the climate side of things, just to kind of start there, is, is obviously the piece around net zero. 
and I'm going to come back to that one in just a second because actually that's probably the most complex one of the whole lot at the moment. Carbon neutral, a phrase that is not the same as net zero and yet very often is being used interchangeably at the moment. Zero carbon, this idea that somehow we're going to magically create whole systems that genuinely have absolutely no carbon associated with them whatsoever. Really? Are we sure? Or is it just about where we've drawn the boundary to conveniently you know, put the zero bit in there and we've conveniently ignored the rest of it? I, I would suggest there are people using phrases like that in a way that really is um, you know, misleading at, at best, if you see what I mean. Decarbonisation, as, as a whole word, it, this whole process by which we actually take carbon out of our systems, carbon offset, carbon inset, scope one, two, three, what that means for an organisation versus everything else. Um, direct carbon removal versus other other topics like carbon avoidance. We're using these words interchangeably, but they are absolutely not the same thing. And by using them interchangeably, we're, we're sort of almost dumbing it down, but equally we're almost afraid to unpack the detail, I think, as well. And we get into pieces around climate mitigation versus climate adaptation. And again, people are confused. They don't know the difference. They haven't bothered to Google it. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. The, the, people are still not quite sure that the, the mitigation piece is all about our attack strategy on carbon. It's all about the pieces towards net zero. It's all about the decarbonisation. It's all about the offset pieces, all those words I've just been using. And then you get to the, the adaptation side of life, which is... The defensive strategy, it's all about the resilience, it's about the bounce back ability of all these systems to the changes that we know are coming. Unless we can actually speak in those terms and be clear about what the differences are between all of them, I think the chances of ending up in the right place in terms of actually analysing the right thing and trying to answer the right question and so on, uh, well, we'd be very fortunate, let's put it that way, to find ourselves in exactly the right place here. And I think coming back to net zero specifically for just a moment, <laughs> I was looking up the other day, and at the last count, I think there's more than 80 published definitions of what net zero is out there now. And some of them are very old, right, and massively out of date, so you wouldn't probably pick them up as, as your sort of choice of definition. But it is completely ridiculous that there are that many definitions out there, because of course it's confusing. How on earth are people supposed to know where to look and what the right answer actually is? And I think for the purposes of, of today and sort of thinking it through in terms of what really, really good looks like, there are, there are two key parts of the net zero definition that really matter. That there's, there's net zero for the world, and there's net zero for, say, a country or something like that, where genuinely you are seeking a state of balance where you understand what the total emissions are and you're trying to get that state of balance in a, in a sense where you can actually sustain that in a consciously, you know, sort of sustainable way for the years ahead. That, that is the big picture of why we're all aiming when we talk about net zero for the whole world. But that is absolutely not the same thing at all as net zero, for example, for an organisation. So for a private sector organisation, so for example, for a consultancy like the company I work for, or for the contractors out there, or for indeed any other type of private sector organisation in particular. Because the, the definition there just does not even apply, because the scale of reduction we've got to get to in terms of these current emissions before we go anywhere near offsetting any residual impact is massive. SBTI, the Science Based Targets Initiative, um, is basically giving guidance at the moment and is only validating people's approaches towards net zero at a corporate level if they can demonstrate how they plan to take 90% of the emissions out of their whole value chain. That's before they get anywhere near offsetting any residual amount because the amount of actual emissions out there right now in a corporate sense is just utterly wasteful, frankly. Now, understanding the distinction between those, even those two different definitions, both of which are called net zero, both of which are sort of correct in the, when used in the right context, is again really, really important. Because unless we know what we're all talking about, we're all just banding around phrases. I mean, there's companies out there right now saying, oh yeah, we're net zero. It's easy. We did it in six months. We just thought about it last year. We've done it. And you look at it and you think, literally, what are you actually talking about? But the trouble is people believe it. Because why would they lie? But what they've done is they've taken a very convenient definition of net zero from some years ago when it was acceptable not to understand the subtleties of this and the scale of reduction that was needed and all the rest of it. And therefore, they've declared in their own unilateral way that they are, in fact, net zero. And I find that really dangerous because at that point, we become quite complacent. We think, we're, you know, this is, this is quite straightforward. All we have to do is pop it on our website and, you know, we're, we're finished. When actually nothing could be further from the truth. And in fact, the people going around saying things like that, I would, I would argue, I mean, that, that's, that's damaging and dangerous, actually, and it's misleading and in a quite active sense. So I'm afraid that is really the state of play in terms of what's actually sort of going on out there right now. But, but it's absolutely critical, in my view at least, that we get this language right and we start to have this honest conversation with each other so we can actually measure the right things. 
But I'm afraid it doesn't end there, even when it just comes to the language side of things, because that's just the piece about climate. <laughs> and then when we, when we come on to think a little bit more broadly about the, the, the bigger challenge of language, we get up into the even bigger concept of sustainability. Again, properly defined. And I mentioned at the beginning that my career started really with me doing a geography degree and then falling into the transport planning side of things. I, I genuinely remember learning about what was probably the 1987 and the 1992 definitions of what is sustainability, the piece where we actually teased out that the social, the environmental, and the economic impacts, and we started to understand that there were, there were three legs to this stool or the triple bottom line, all that sort of language that was, that was around at that time. We have a whole generation of infrastructure professionals in our industry right now who don't know that that's the definition of sustainability. They don't understand that sustainability, when properly defined, is about meeting the needs of the current generation without actually sacrificing the needs of the next generation and the ones to come after that. Because no, we, we've, ne we've never talked about it. We've never talked about it. And, and the subject choices that a lot of our engineers are making in school before they get anywhere near a university course or an apprenticeship or whatever it might be, naturally mean that very often they're not coming across some of these social sciences. They're not being taught some of these things. And therefore, we've got an industry full of people from decades and decades and decades who simply, it's not sort of willful, you know, ignorance or not being aware of it. It's just that they haven't come across it. And they're busy doing their own technical work and so on. But it, it really is absolutely critical to me that, that we really do start to think in this whole sustainability sense. So we obviously know we've got the sustainable development goals. Before that, we had the millennium goals. We seem to have failed to achieve those. So we reinvented them as sustainable development goals. We're supposed to be halfway through achieving those by now. They're supposed to be finished by 2030. I'm not aware that we're halfway through in terms of that sort of <laughs> progress <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of the real side of things. I think it's actually pretty scary that we start to think about that. But once again, we, we hit challenges of language. I mean, putting aside the climate piece for a minute and moving into, for example, the, the social piece of sustainability, it's been 10 years in the UK since we passed the Social Value Act. It's actually been illegal for 10 years not to consider the creation of social value whenever we're spending public money. Interesting, isn't it? Because it's only in the last year that I've seen anything coming through in terms of actual procurement and that kind of thing that actually starts to point at this and say, we're, we're going to give you marks. And we're, going to, you know, we're either going to give you work or not give you work based on whether or not you can demonstrate your understanding of social value and what's actually going to come through in this side of things. Uh, it's, been, it's been 271 years since the first definition of sustainability first came out. It was to do with forestry in Germany, apparently, about something to do with don't take more from the forest in a year than it can grow, because otherwise you end up in trouble. And when I, when I repeated that to some of my Australian colleagues the other day, they said, actually, you need to go back right to the Aborigines, and apparently there's all kinds of, uh, obviously not written down, <laughs> um, sort of heritage and history there in terms of the way that they have approached, you know, the looking after, essentially, places for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So I find it totally terrifying that we're sitting here in 2022 and we still haven't really understood what this concept actually means. We haven't understood it from the environmental point of view. We haven't really understood it from a social point of view. And we, we have, to some extent, understood the economic side of things, but we haven't understood it in terms of the equity or the inequality side of the argument, the fairness, the social justice piece. There's an opportunity here to put all of it together and to really start to think about what these words mean and use that as a benchmark much, much more clearly, I think, in terms of what we do in the sense of infrastructure. Because if, if we don't, I just genuinely do not think we can stand here and say that we think that what we're delivering is really good in any sense. Because if those are the big world problems in terms of achieving, you know, big picture sustainability, as a, you know, as an outcome for the world, which is pretty grandiose when you think about it, but, you know, we have to start somewhere on the ground with the local type of action and effort and so on, and we've got to have something that guides that. If that is the thing we're aiming for in terms of sustainable infrastructure, then it follows that really good means we've really got to start to think about that. And I, I would argue at the moment that we really are a very, very long way off that. So in terms of getting that much more right, though, that then leads you around to, okay, so what kind of people do we need? Because we've obviously got, you know, an industry full of thousands, millions of people all over the world who, you know, they, they love their world of civil engineering, of infrastructure and the wider engineering sectors and so on across all different, um, you know, sectors, uh, whether, again, we're talking about transport or buildings or water, energy, waste, digital, etc. I would suggest that what we need going forward is to pull through 
some of the people we've already got in our industry, but also we need to show a little bit of greater respect and attract others towards us who, who are able to be the, the innovators and the leaders, the, the ideas people in some of this space that I'm talking about here. I think we also need far more in the way of translators and connectors and interpreters, that all these points around language. People have got to start to speak about this in far, far plainer English, I think, and actually just say, I'm sorry, you know, can you just explain what that actually means or can you help me to see how that relates to my work? Because once people see it, it is a funny thing with sustainability. Once you start to see it, of course, it's quite difficult to unsee it because you start to realise that actually the nature of what you've been doing perhaps isn't as good as it, as it might have been. So I think we need all sorts of people who are able to do that translation, that interpreting, that connection. And I would hope that as efforts towards you know, greater industry diversity and so on come through and start to bear fruit and so on, that actually we might find, because we're taking in a broad intake, we actually do manage to find the sorts of people who are able to use those sorts of uh, communication skills. But of course, we still need people who are able to deliver and design and operate all of our different infrastructure systems. But it would be lovely, wouldn't it, if, they could, if, if people in those roles now and going forward increasingly could actually have some of this thinking, not necessarily all of it. We don't all have to be expert in everything. But it would be lovely, wouldn't it, if they could actually really start to bring some of that thinking to their everyday work. Because actually, who better to see how to make incremental improvements to the systems we've already got out there which is the vast majority of what we've got to live with for the, for the decades ahead, than the people who already understand them. It does strike me that you know, we're, we're not taking full advantage of those sides of things as, as it stands today. But I think in terms of kind of standing back from all of that, and all of that really is one enormous point around language and understanding what we're talking about, <laughs> standing back from all of that, there's a really strong link then immediately into pieces to do with um, ownership and accountability, and it keeps on going to sleep, there we go. And really the challenge of, of being confident that we feel that we should be taking ownership of all of these sorts of issues, that we should be taking accountability for them, and, and really seeing that the power and the influence of what we actually do, and this is where I start to get really quite excited about this, because I think, as I said at the beginning, there has not been a more exciting time for infrastructure than the, the moment we're sort of standing across right now. Because I suppose in the one sense, you, you can sort of feel a bit overwhelmed. These sorts of concepts, these are huge concepts and topics. They are things that people are deeply uncomfortable with in some ways because they haven't necessarily come to terms with the, the detail of what they really mean just yet. It can feel quite overwhelming. But then the, I think probably the way out of that in the quickest possible sense is to start to say, okay, so right, so what is actually ours to do? What is mine to do? What is it that only I or people like me can actually do to really make a bit of a difference here? And you know, where can I bring the most value? And I think probably the answer is in this ownership side of things. Because we have been so responsible for creating a lot of these crisis points that are actually out there in the world, and I, and I say that with no apology, really, because I think we have to sort of own that issue in terms of where we sit right now. Because of that, I think it's absolutely right that we take this ownership as we go forward of these issues, and we, and we continue to put ourselves at the heart of the problem in terms of trying to resolve it and trying to do absolutely everything we can. Because I think if we choose not to take that ownership, then we've only really got ourselves to blame when others step in and start to resolve things for us or when others start to you know, look at us and think, well, what, you know, what is it you do? I don't understand. How, how can you sit here and not respond to the, these big points out there? And I think maybe there's a generational point in all of this, which becomes quite interesting, actually. Um, I, was, I was involved in some work, um, WSP side recently, where we realised that we've actually got five generations of people in the workforce at the moment. And, and a lot of the big consultancies and contractors and indeed, I suppose, universities like this one would, would find the same if they start to look out across their whole cohorts right now. So we've got everything from people who are, who are near retirement in sort of the boomers one and two type, type generations. We've got, we've got Generation X, we've got millennials, we've got Generation Z or Z, or depending on where you are in the world. And of course, it's only going to be five years before Generation Alpha join in. Apparently, we've gone around the alphabet again, and we're, we can't really come up the alphabet one more time. So that, in another five years, those people are, I think, roughly speaking, about 10 now. Or 11, they're coming up to secondary school. So another five years, some of them will be coming into the junior end of the workforce. So we've currently got five generations. We're about to have, we're about to have six. And it, it just strikes me in terms of actually this ownership piece and this confidence piece, that if we start at the more senior end of our industry, what we've got sitting essentially in that sort of older cohort, if I'm allowed to call it that, we've got a lot of people who've spent many, many decades building really, really successful careers and loving the fact they've been involved with the creation and the improvement of infrastructure systems. And I guess the sting in the tail for people who are finding themselves in that position right now 
is that now we've got all this understanding of these issues, for example, to do with the climate crisis, to do with this bigger sustainability picture, it's actually a really difficult place to, to sort of put down a career because you think, well, hang on a minute, I'm just realising that actually I maybe should have been taking some responsibility for this, some ownership of it, and, and now it's almost as if, you know, the, the, the clock is ticking and, and my opportunity to do that perhaps has gone. I'm actually, it's quite interesting, I'm always starting to pick up in some cases almost a sense of guilt, perhaps, in places. It's fascinating. My first boss retired uh, last month, a couple of months ago, and they presented him with a book of all the fantastic infrastructure transport projects that he'd been involved with over the years. He opened it and he said, oh, I just felt awful. It's just a book of carbon. What have I done? And he actually, he's finding it really difficult even just to open it and look at it, even though he's really proud of the projects that, you know, he's delivered over, over all those years. He's finding it really difficult. Now, in his case, his response is, he's down in Devon, he's bought himself some land and he's genuinely planting a forest, which I think is pretty impressive, actually. <laughs> his plan is to put right some of that carbon-related harm that he's caused. But coming back more generally, I suppose, to the the people who find themselves at, at, at that, that senior level of their careers now in very, very influential positions in many, many cases. My argument is in terms of taking that ownership, in terms of being confident that we are in need of this change, actually there's a whole lot of work that could be done by people who are already in those senior roles, even if they won't necessarily still be the same people in those roles in, say, 10 years' time, 15 years' time, whatever, to actually see these things through. Just actually getting started on that change is so important. And in the middle of our industry, we've then got a whole load of people, thousands of them, probably millions of us if you look all around the world. I suppose people like me, who are, they're halfway through their careers, and they look back and they see the way things have been done, they look forward and they say, well, I want to be part of something that feels really good for the future. And yet this lack of definition, this lack of clarity, this lack of a common language is really, really holding that back. It's very, very difficult to quite see, you know, what is mine to do? What can I actually do? And of course, some of these people are going to find themselves in increasingly senior roles as time goes on, and they will have the potential, if they don't already, to really you know, generate significant influence and change as they go through. And I think, for me, this, this is the cohort that still obviously has more time to do anything in terms of creating that change, and it's absolutely critical that we, we do what we can to fill in that education piece, that language piece, that understanding piece, so that as many people as possible can really engage with that. And then, of course, at the more junior end of our industry, we have just got hordes of people who are desperately keen. The reason they're here, the reason they want to come into infrastructure and engineering these days and so on, is in part because they, they, they can see this connection already. They, they've grown up with it. They've been surrounded by you know, the, our, our sort of cultural awareness of things to do with sustainability and climate change and so on. And of course, there's, you know, there's many of you in the room now, and it's fantastic because actually it is, it is this generation coming in now and coming into the industry and, and hopefully sticking with it for many years who will absolutely be the ones who can change the game because there is loads of time, there's decades of time to really be confident and to take that ownership and say, no, you know what? We're not going to do it this way anymore. We're going to be brave. And this is where people will need support up through these different generations and so on. And I, and I, think, I think overall that, that a couple of really key things that we could start to do differently is things like, for example as and when we come forward with an infrastructure solution to something or a I don't know, new system solution to something, it could be anything, couldn't it? I feel that as this group of generations, as this industry as a whole, we need to be a bit braver at maybe taking some of these options off the table. So I'm not even going to offer this option here. I know it's how we would have done it yesterday, but we're not even going to offer that as an option. We're just going to discount it right now and put it down. And we're actually going to come up with three or four other options to consider that do fit with this new way of thinking. And we're going to take best advantage of the brains at that, so that junior, that middle, that senior end of our industry to really start to bring through that kind of change, to make, it, to make it acceptable to be bold in terms of that change. Because I think otherwise, actually, we will fail this challenge of confidence because we will carry on. It's always going to be easier to do it the way we did yesterday because we've already, already proven that way probably works. We've already proven it's fairly safe, it's fairly low risk, etc. We understand the costs better. But I think what we're going to have to do is take a few of these flying leaps and not necessarily you know, enormous great jumps in one step, but just try to make sure that we're actually going forward each time. And I think in order to do that, we have to have that boldness. We have to be clear in the way that we're communicating and explain why we're taking that approach. Because actually, at that point, 
we find ourselves on the same side as some of the people who were throwing those carbon rocks, for example, earlier on in terms of members of the general public. We'll, we'll find ourselves you know, in tune with actually what many of the wider public actually want to see us doing right now. And then if we can take advantage of the fact that we've got these different generations, this different expertise and knowledge and all these fantastic brains, and, and the fact that we've got generalists as well as deep specialists in all these different areas, we could really start to put things together in quite an exciting way, I would suggest. So coming on to the the third of the sort of the key challenge areas, I guess, and coming away from this point around ownership and, and confidence and so on, and, and just taking on board all those pieces around actually what that really good piece in terms of sustainability and in terms of addressing the, this existential climate crisis actually looks like, it strikes me that the, the, the final piece, for today at least, <laughs> in terms of where we go, is going to be determined by... Oh, hang on a second. By pace. Because it's very tempting, I suspect, having laid out all sorts of quite big concepts and you know, people are thinking, oh, I need to go and look into this and I want to have a bit of a think about that and I want to check if she was right when she said there were 80 definitions of net zero and all that kind of thing. The trouble is that the one thing we don't have, particularly when it comes to the climate crisis side of things, is time. Because actually, in order to get anywhere near our net zero target for 2050, a, that assumes the luxury of time that we have until 2050 to get to this net zero place, which, by the way, is, is fairly uh, ambitious, shall we say. But it also, in, in the overall grand scheme of things, forgets, in terms of having that luxury of time available to us, that thought time and so on, there are many parts of the world where right now the battle is nothing to do with net zero by 2050. They are dealing with the absolute, on-the-ground, resilience challenge of just getting into next week in terms of what's actually going on out there in the world. And that's not just climate resilience, that's all sorts of other types of resilience as well. So I would, I would again put it to all of you that I think the one thing we do not have is the luxury of time to go away and perfect this beautiful plan that will lay out absolutely everything we're going to do and now we shall pick off point one and now we should pick off point two. Yes, of course we need to have this plan. Of course we need to speak this common language. Of course we need to take advantage of all these different you know, minds and different generations, as I've been saying, that we have in the industry. But we also have to just get on with it. We've got to take half the carbon out of our infrastructure systems this decade. And we're already halfway through 2022. And that's not just me saying that. That's, that's the IPCC saying that. We've got to essentially take half the carbon out of our infrastructure systems by the end of this decade, otherwise our chances of holding the global temperature rise down to anything like one and a half degrees, even two, essentially goes broadly out of the window. Because at the moment, our carbon emissions are still going up, despite the fact that we're talking all about decarbonizing, which is pretty scary. And of course, we're not in control of all of it, and you can get into all kinds of debates, and we're like, oh, we're just, we're just a tiny little country, we're only responsible for a tiny percentage of the carbon emissions. Yes. But what we do can be the leadership piece that makes the much wider change elsewhere. And, and also, it's not that simple because, of course, the, some of the carbon emissions associated with things that we consume here are, in fact, produced elsewhere. So, in fact, our footprint is far, far larger than we would care to admit and so on. And so we really do need to start to get on with this pace of change. And I think, I suppose, th this temptation to stop and think and go carefully. It, it's a very natural human tendency. It's definitely very much a sort of a careful engineering tendency, isn't it? We don't like to rush to solutions. We don't like to be pushed into, come on, you know, you have to put your answer on the line and that kind of thing. But frankly, all of these different aspects of sustainability are gonna just keep on presenting themselves as overlapping crisis points. The climate crisis is our way into this. That is the existential crisis that's sitting right out there right now that we absolutely have to deal with. But on the back of that, we've got all these other waves of crisis coming to do with biodiversity and to do with social inequalities and that kind of thing. It is only by actually getting started and making some of these reasonably fast-paced changes that we can possibly expect to get anywhere. And if we think that we're sitting here in the UK feeling quite safe and secure, it's a nice warm summer's evening, what's the problem? We then have to think about in the last 20 years, we have seen 10 of the hottest summers on record ever. And we've seen six of the wettest years on record ever. And that's just round here. So if we think that we can just sit here comfortably and sort of, you know, as I say, take our time, have a good old think about it and, and worry, you know, worry less about what's happening with everybody else around the rest of the world, just, just let's look after ourselves. 
I think we really are kidding ourselves, and we're literally walking ourselves into a bit of a trap in terms of that resilience piece, because we're not spending the time building up our resilience, and nor are we spending our time cutting the carbon nearly far enough. Because this situation where we are right now is, coming back to where I started, just part of this never-ending sequence of change, and we can fully expect it to continue to change as we, as we go forward. So my final point, really, for this evening, I suspect you're delighted to hear that, is, is that really this is all about defining really good in the context of infrastructure around these key points to do with this pace of change, to do with acting today, to do with understanding what we're actually talking about and owning the issue so that we genuinely are able to take these bold steps forward because we have to get to grips with this climate piece. We have to get to grips with, not just with the net zero piece but also with the resilience piece because as I was just saying, if we don't do that then frankly we have only ourselves to blame when certain things start to happen and we say, oh, we didn't, we didn't realise it was going to be that bad. And you just think, yes, we did. We just, we just didn't look around the world. We just didn't think about what it actually might be. So, so where I think this, though, gets really, really exciting overall is that actually beyond all these issues to do with sustainability, beyond all the specific points to do with climate action and so on, I think there's another much more self-interested opportunity out here for those of us sitting inside these infrastructure circles. And that's this point about reinvention. I said at the beginning that this is probably the most exciting time, I think, genuinely, in terms of you know, being anything to do with what we actually do. And I genuinely do mean that, because I think this is the ticket to prove ourselves in terms of our relevance, in terms of our visibility, in terms of the level of interest we attract from the wider world. If we can actually get to grips with all these issues, there is no doubt that we will, you know, by, by default, really, be seen through totally different eyes by people all over the world because we genuinely have done something to advance the state of the art, to actually take us towards a set of systems that are genuinely really, really good within the 2020s and beyond. So to me, I think it's all about three... Oh, keeps on going to sleep. There we go. The three things that I've talked about, hopefully, over the course of uh, this evening. So to me, really, really good sustainable infrastructure comes down to these three points. It's about clarity, it's about addressing this challenge of language, it's around confidence and ownership of the challenge, and it's about pace and realising that this really, really is urgent and exciting. So there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>